Well, good morning. It's uh, good to be here. And I applaud uh, Penn State for sponsoring this type of discussion. It's the type of discussion we need if we're going to be moving our performance forward in the area of safety. Uh, it's a solid effort to move the discussion away from politics towards a more problem solving format, uh, which is going to help us succeed in the future. As uh, was mentioned, I'm Tony Bombico. I'm Arch's VP of Safety. And uh, Arch is based in St. Louis. Uh, yesterday, uh, we were comprised of 11 subsidiary mining companies and 4,700 employees. Uh, today, we have 24 subsidiary <laughs> operations and 7,400 employees. Uh, we uh, merged or completed the acquisition last night with the International Coal Group, uh, so they're now a part of our company. What I'm going to be talking about uh, is largely focused on uh, what we've done at the uh, 11 subsidiary companies that were a part of Arch uh, prior to last night at midnight and uh, what we hope to be doing in migrating that process over to ICG. Um, what I'm going to do is share some of the ideas that Arch has implemented to try to improve safety and um, we've had some success with these concepts and they largely revolve around the ideas of leadership, employee involvement, uh, developing a solid safety culture and problem solving. And um, for the most part, they center on trying to encourage people to do the right thing, similar to what ALP is doing with the Running Right program. Now, I've worked at Arch for seven years, and it's truly been uh, a pleasure working for a company that um, embraces safety as a value. At Arch, uh, safety is a core value. It's, it's who we are. And uh, our goal is to reach the perfect zero. Uh, the motto is home safely, everyone, every day. And we uh, sincerely think that this goal is achievable. Now, historically, Arch has uh, performed pretty solidly from a safety standpoint. This slide looks at our reportable incident rate uh, from 1998 forward. And over that period of time, we've had a 76% improvement in our lost time and uh, medical, uh, medical injuries. Uh, also, compared to the industry, you know, we've done well. Uh, this chart looks at lost time incident rates over a five-year period. And uh, compared to the um, uh, national average for all coal, uh, Arch has performed about 72% better uh, than, the, uh, than the industry average. I will note, however, that um, uh, these numbers are looking backward. And uh, one of the speakers mentioned earlier that uh, they're not good predictors of what future performance is going to be. And, and this year we had a, a pretty good example of how true that is. Uh, we had two large operations last year. Uh, one, our SUFCO operation in Utah, a large long wall mine underground, and uh, also our Colmac operation, a large surface mine uh, in West Virginia. Both of those operations worked the entire year without a reportable injury. And this year we started out at those two operations and within the first two months, uh, those two operations had six reportables. So you can't rely on your past performance as a predictor of what you're going to do in the future. Well, we've had some success, but it, it's success that hasn't occurred overnight. And largely, our safety process was constructed in layers. Uh, we had a number of building blocks that were put in place over time. And I'm going to take a few minutes to discuss some of the building blocks that led us to where our current program is at. The um, centerpiece of the safety process when I moved to uh, Arch seven years ago uh, was a set of uh, key safety principles which we refer to as division safety plans. And each of these um, principles was adopted by the subsidiary operations. And they served as somewhat of the centerpiece of the, the safety process. Um, these um, uh, were basically minimum corporate standards that were put in place. And uh, they were developed prior to my coming to Arch uh, as a result of an intervention that they had with, with DuPont. And they um, uh, created a solid foundation, but uh, there was still more to do. In 2004, we added a continuous improvement layer on top of the division safety plans. And this was a systems-based, goal-oriented goal process that follows an annual cycle. It focuses basically on identifying and closing measurable gaps in safety performance. Uh, each year, uh, each of our operations develops an SIP, or safety improvement plan. Uh, they evaluate uh, key safety performance metrics and established three to five improvement targets per year. 
uh, corporate safety visits each of the operations at the beginning of the year and midway through the year to discuss their strategies and their progress. And at the end of the year, we evaluate what they've accomplished and we start the process all over again. It's a pretty simple, basic process. Cross-operational safety audits um, were another technique that we've adopted. Uh, this is a layer that's built on top of the safety audits that each of the operations conducts on a monthly basis. And the concept's pretty simple. Uh, we take people from mines A, B, and C, and we go to mine D. Uh, the objective is to get a snapshot of the safety process at that mine that's being audited. And we use the audits as a way to look at uh, the safety plans uh, that are in place, uh, the SIPs, uh, the basic uh, safety components of their process, and their behavior-based safety process. Uh, the audit structure is pretty straightforward. Uh, we start with conducting an overview of what we're going to do with the uh, senior management at the mine. Uh, hazard training is conducted. We review their safety plan and their SIP. We conduct a site inspection. Uh, we interview a sample of employees. Uh, we provide management with feedback at the end of the day. Uh, we discuss best practices and we formalize uh, the event in an audit report. Uh, our audit process focuses on the uh, key safety processes that are listed here. Uh, we've developed a series of checklists uh, that help the auditors evaluate the operation standards in these basic areas. And we've also developed a set of questionnaires that we use to interview a cross-section of employees. Our objective is to obtain a snapshot of the operation's health and safety process. It's not intended to be a wall-to-wall -wall inspection. Uh, our aim is to evaluate what the employees know about health, the health and safety process at their mine. We're trying to gauge what their knowledge is of their safety process. And we also focus attention on trying to identify the best practices at the mine and providing them with constructive feedback. Uh, we attempt to audit uh, four to five operations per year, and we don't conduct these on a rotational basis. If an operation is having some issues in the health and safety area, uh, we uh, tend to pick on them more frequently than the others. Now, initially, this, this process has, has evolved over time. Initially, when we conducted these audits starting in 2004, uh, we used safety professionals from the different mines. Uh, we now have evolved to the point where we're involving hourly employees or key operations and maintenance personnel uh, to participate in the audit teams. Um, the cross-operational audit uh, process serves a, a number of purposes, uh, the most important of which are to involve more employees in the process and to visibly demonstrate that ARCH is committed to safety. When these audit teams show up, and in many cases involve hourly employees from, every, from other mines, it's, it sends a very strong message about how serious uh, the corporate uh, corporation is about safety. Now, I'll, I won't go into as much detail, but I'll mention a few of the other things we do to try to maintain momentum and address uh, specific issues. Uh, ARCH holds an annual safety summit uh, for key managers, safety professionals, and BBS uh, personnel. That meeting is going to get a heck of a lot bigger next January when we have all the ICG folks uh, join in. Uh, it's really it's an opportunity for us to review uh, the accomplishments of the operations and to establish uh, new objectives. Uh, we also hold uh, regional safety workshops every year. Uh, for our, it started, they, those workshops started as a developmental exercise for safety professionals. Uh, they've grown to include our behavior-based uh, uh, safety personnel, and uh, we now have uh, management personnel that are coming to join into those discussions. So it's always, always, uh, it's, it's always a very beneficial type of meeting. Uh, and in addition, we've uh, developed some specific processes to address some key risk areas, such as contractor safety, uh, emergency preparedness. Uh, we recently, with the system from MSHA, just conducted our third a uh, large-scale MERD out of the West Elk uh, operation involved over 200 uh, people. And uh, we have a very comprehensive crisis communication policy that we have in place at each of our mines and uh, an explosives safety policy. And the processes that, that I've mentioned were all in place by 2006. Uh, they've helped us to improve, but at that point we weren't satisfied. Uh, we felt that um, we plateaued and we were still having too many injuries. Uh, so we uh, were looking for ways in which we could try to get ourselves to the next level. Uh, we firmly believe that one injury was one too many. And that's why in, in 2006, we adopted behavior-based safety 
as our key strategy for getting to the next level. Uh, Behavior-based safety is a process. Uh, it starts with the daily tasks that each employee performs. Uh, each of our sites uh, has a management sponsor and a steering committee uh, to support the process. Uh, the committee is key to the process. Uh, uh, they develop a uh, list of critical behaviors that are used in the observation process. Uh, observers identify exposures that may lead to injuries, and then they provide uh, feedback on whether behaviors are safe or at risk. Uh, the data collected during the observations is entered into a tracking software uh, that identifies um, uh, at-risk trends. And these trends are then analyzed to identify improvement opportunities and to facilitate problem solving. Now the decision to adopt behavior-based safety within ARCH was, was made on an operation-by-operation basis. Uh, we started with two pilot sites, one in Wyoming and one in West Virginia. Our uh, uh, Thunder Basin or Black Thunder Mine in Wyoming uh, was the kickoff site there, and our Mountain Laurel operation in West Virginia was the kickoff site there. And between uh, 2006 and 2009, we fully implemented uh, behavior-based safety at each of our operations. It took on average uh, 12 uh, to 18 months to fully implement the process. Now the behavior-based process we implemented is not just another safety program. Uh, it was designed by a company called Behavior Science Technology, and this is a systems-based improvement process. Uh, it contains, it starts with a comprehensive organizational assessment. Uh, it contains a leadership development component. Uh, it involves a structured improvement process, and employees are trained in how to collect data and how to uh, engage in problem solving. Uh, the process also contains an evaluation mechanism. Now, phase one of the process we implemented involves a comprehensive survey uh, that's used to assess each operation's safety culture and leadership style. Uh, the OCDI survey and leadership diagnostic look at factors that predict uh, future safety performance, and it's a statistically validated uh, instrument. Uh, we followed up with uh, behavior-based safety and coaching workshops for key managers, and in addition, uh, each site sponsored leadership and interpersonal skills training for uh, supervisor so that they knew what they needed to do to support the process. Phase two of the impl implementation process um, uh, involves the actual process structure. Uh, each site uh, designated a management sponsor, and in some cases uh, this was the general manager. At other sites uh, was another credible manager uh, who was recognized as a safety leader. Uh, the sponsor, the management sponsor, serves as a liaison between the steering committee and the management team. Uh, each site also selects a BBS facilitator, and these are full-time positions. Uh, the facilitator basically helps to guide the steering committee. At our sites, we've used both hourly employees and frontline supervisors in this role. And this, the steering committee itself, however, normally consists of uh, primarily hourly employees. Uh, the committee is the key component that makes the process work. Uh, they develop a critical behavior inventory. Uh, that inventory is used to conduct the observations, and they introduce the process uh, by training other employees uh, to, to act as observers. Phase three is the actual guts of the process. It involves uh, the actual conducting of observations. Uh, observers gather data on exposures and at-risk behaviors that contribute to injuries. Uh, Near-miss incident reporting is also encouraged. Uh, the objective is to gather meaningful information to facilitate problem solving. Uh, the focus is on barrier identification and barrier removal. Uh, ARCH's behavior-based process also contains a, an evaluation component. Uh, a consultant from BST was assigned to each of our operations to help with the implementation. Uh, they provided feedback during the implementation process. Uh, they also helped to coach uh, the key leaders and management team at the mine. And um, at each operations implement, as each of the operations implementation phases uh, neared completion, uh, they went through a comprehensive sustainability review. Uh, and it uh, basically provided the operation management with uh, uh, recommendations on what they needed to do to sustain the process and to keep the process moving forward. And finally, after 18 to 24 months after the impl implementation was started, uh, we went through a second organizational cultural assessment at each of our operations. 
And that uh, second OCDI was basically to uh, measure how much they'd improved uh, since the process was implemented. Now, our consultants were all very helpful <coughs> in help, helping to guide us through the implementation process. But to make this process work, you, you really have to make it your own. And at ARCH, we've taken a number of additional measures to try to make the process uh, sustainable in each of our operations. I'll provide a few examples of how we're adapting behavior-based safety to the ARCH operations. Uh, first, we're trying to, to meld uh, behavior-based safety into our overall safety process. Uh, at our annual safety summit, uh, we now invite uh, the behavior-based safety steering teams uh, to that meeting. Uh, we also hold annual um, regional safety manager workshops, uh, which we now invite our facilitators, our sponsors, and our, our observers to participate in. Uh, in addition, uh, ARCH has trained four of its people as uh, internal behavior-based safety consultants. Uh, right now, we're in the process of also uh, completing training for 10 of our facilitators in, in an advanced uh, facilitator training program and we're basically trying to uh, develop an internal infrastructure to help us uh, support BBS as we go forward. Uh, when we start uh, to implement uh, BBS at the um, ICG operations we're actually going to be using these advanced facilitators to roll out the process. Uh, so we're going to have uh, essentially hourly people that are trained in behavior-based safety that go to the uh, ICG sites uh, to help them implement. And we think that's going to have a, a very significant impact on convincing the people at the new mines that we're, we're serious about this process. You know, a few other examples that um, uh, we're using to try to involve our observers in the safety process. Uh, we're asking our steering team members for input on injury and near-miss reports. So we're actually involving them in the process of analyzing our, our, our injuries. Uh, in addition, we hold um, observer networking sessions uh, regionally to exchange ideas. Uh, we sponsor regional uh, facilitator meetings to exchange best, best practices. And we're inviting facilitators to participate in the cross-operational audit process. And it's uh, surprisingly, uh, when we started some of this, we thought we would get a lot of blowback from our operations people about uh, the amount of time that we're uh, engaging in this. But as the process has developed, uh, they're seeing the value of taking the time to engage in this. It's, it's helping them improve uh, their, their processes internally. It's developing these resources. And we're, we're now getting a surprising amount of support from our management structure uh, for these type of activities. I know it was mentioned earlier about uh, looking at injury stats as the way that um, uh, you judge your safety performance. Well, we're trying to move beyond that. Uh, and um, we've actually adopted a number of uh, what we call upstream performance measures. Uh, so in addition to looking at uh, LTA, severity, and reportable trends, uh, we're looking at uh, uh, we having each of our operations establish targets in the area of observation or contact rate. Uh, the um, uh, observation quality, uh, the percentage of the workforce that they have trained and actively involved in the observation process, and the percentage of barriers uh, to safe performance that they're, that they're having removed. And in the long term, we think that upstream measures of this type uh, will be a better indicator of where we're at from a safety standpoint. Uh, these type of indicators, uh, in addition to future uh, organizational cultural assessments, I think will uh, give us a better read on where we're at as an organization. Uh, I think the most significant thing that we've done uh, to make this work at ARCH is to, to demonstrate visible safety leadership. Uh, a few examples of that, uh, our president and COO, John Eaves, uh, Paul Lang, who's our senior vice president of operations, and myself have a regular schedule of visits that we conduct uh, at each of the uh, operations. And the purpose of those visits is to go out and sit down with the behavior-based uh, safety steering teams, uh, get a gauge of where they're at, have them update us on some of their issues, and uh, have a frank discussion about what we need to keep the process moving. Um, uh, they've even taken us at a couple of operations, taken us out to the field and trained us how to conduct observations. So we think activities of that, si uh, that type uh, demonstrate uh, that the organization is serious about safety. And I think probably the most significant thing we did uh, to make this work is um, 
after we had uh, the first series of site implementations completed, uh, we had three of our uh, behavior-based safety facilitators uh, come and address our board of directors. And they gave um, a very moving presentation to the board about what they were doing. And the, the board had the opportunity to express their appreciation for the activity they engaged in. You know, another thing that we're doing is, you know, we're encouraging each of the operations to adopt their own identity. Uh, we're not taking a cookie cutter approach. There's a, there's a common structure to this thing, but we're uh, encouraging them uh, to act on the fact that one size doesn't fit all and to try to modify and adapt this process to where it, um, it, it suits their operation. Uh, each site is viewed as unique. Uh, we've made a point of not trying to compare progress at one site with another site. And each of our sites has um, developed their own acronym, their own name and symbols to try to capture their unique character. Uh, at um, the Mount Laurel Mine, they call their process the SLOW process, which stands for safely leading our people to excellence. At our dugout mine, they call themselves the dogs, uh, developing awareness while generating safety. At Southco, they're referred to as the sharks, uh, stop hazards and risk and kick shortcuts. And at Southco, the management team has actually gone out and bought, bought them a shark mobile, uh, which they use to conduct observations. It's a large pickup truck because out in Utah, you can drive right underground and it has a shark emblem on the side. And when they engage in their observations, uh, that's the means of transportation they have to get around the mine. Uh, they also take it to um, uh, parades in the community to uh, engage, uh, engage the community in that. And uh, the first process we started was in Wyoming, and that's the SABRES process, and that stands for uh, Safe Action Brings Employees Real Satisfaction. So is our process working? Um, we think it is. Uh, it's been five years since we started the process, and we're seeing a number of positive trends. Uh, first of which is uh, improving, improvement in our traditional indicators. Uh, they've continued to trend downward. Um, we've identified and removed a lot of exposures. Uh, we're reinforcing safe uh, work behaviors. A number of specific ba barriers to safe performance have been eliminated. Our culture and process has been strengthened. Um, and we've seen some uh, in benefits in developing employees and um, general feedback we get from the process is that um, it's very, uh, very progressive. I think one of the biggest benefits we've seen is the uh, increased level of employee involvement. Uh, we have more people involved in peer-to-peer -peer observations. Uh, they're actively identifying and eliminating exposures. I would estimate at this point that we probably have 70% of our employees that are actively involved in this process. Uh, the number of uh, CAVE people, uh, which stands for Citizens Against Virtually Everything, uh, the number of CAVE people that were there when the process started has gradually decreased over time. And um, it, it's kind of uh, ironic. Some of the people that were the biggest detractors of the program, uh, once they've been converted and become involved, they're actually the strongest supporters. Um, so it's, uh, it's had a big positive effect in that area. Uh, this is largely, uh, I think, similar to John's process. It's a no name, no blame, no sneak up process. Uh, no discipline results out of the actual observation process. Uh, the only goal here is improvement. You know, what you're trying to do is to get uh, information about uh, at-risk and safe behaviors uh, in your operation to come to the surface. Now, you know, similar to, to Alpha, uh, this doesn't mean that outside of the observation process, if somebody's seen doing something that is, uh, is, is not proper, that uh, the, the right type of action is taken, but within the context of the observation process, uh, we've uh, maintained the, the, um, the sanctity of no name, no blame. Here's a few hard numbers uh, that uh, some of the things we look at from a behavior-based perspective. In the last five years, our subsidiary operations have um, uh, actually trained over 2,700 observers. Uh, they've conducted nearly 120,000 observations uh, involving over 150,000 employees and have removed uh, over 3,100 barriers to safe performance. Uh, these are numbers that were uh, effective at the end of uh, April. So they've, they've actually probably gone up a little bit since then. 
Now, behavior-based safety is largely about problem solving. And um, it's geared towards identifying rem and removing uh, barriers to safe performance. Uh, a barrier is anything that prevents or makes safe behavior more difficult. Uh, it can be a physical barrier, uh, a process barrier, or a cultural barrier. Uh, barriers are identified through observations or near-miss uh, incidents. And uh, the removal method depends largely on whether they're uh, enabled, uh, difficult, or not enabled. I'll give you a few examples of some of the barriers that uh, our folks have removed. Uh, at one of our underground mines, um, observers identified uh, an equipment condition exposure that uh, created a potential pinch point. Uh, they had a locomotive with an opening in the canopy uh, that enabled an individual to stand up and expose their head to the top. Uh, in fact, uh, they had a, a, an employee that uh, actually got his head stuck uh, between the canopy and an overcast. Uh, the solution was to uh, redesign the canopy so that it, it had no opening. At, uh, one of our surface mines, observers identified a mounting dismounting barrier. Uh, they identified a loader with a, uh, without a proper handrail. Uh, the solution was to install a handrail that enabled three-point contact uh, while mounting and dismounting the equipment. And observers at uh, one of our prep plants identified a fall hazard uh, that had existed for a long period of time. Uh, this was a plant that had worked years without a lost time of reportable injury, uh, as one of the speakers mentioned earlier, they had been lucky. Uh, the steering committee arranged to eliminate the exposure by having a guard installed. And uh, these are just a few of the uh, many barriers uh, that our observers have acted upon. And, and one note here, I think that uh, it's very important not to just focus this process on the day-to-day uh, -day type of barriers that can result in an uh, individual injury. You also have to take this process and apply it uh, to major hazards or major risks uh, that present the potential for uh, more serious type of, type of catastrophic events. So uh, this is a process that not only applies to injury prevention, uh, but applies also to uh, major hazard prevention. Now ultimately, we think that behavior-based safety has made our safety process and our culture stronger. Uh, it's helped by involving more employees improving com communication pro flow, and by upgrading our problem-solving skills. Uh, the key to this process is to get as many people committed to be observers as you possibly can. Because as a rule, an observer will hold themselves to a higher standard. Uh, if they're going to go out and observe others, they have to set a good example. Uh, they also tend to be more enthusiastic about the overall safety process if they're actively engaged in the observation process. And one clearly unforeseen benefit of this process is um, it's helped us to identify a whole new talent pool uh, of future leaders at the ARCH operations. In the process of training these people as observers and facilitators, uh, we've discovered a lot of leadership potential uh, that we weren't aware of prior to starting this. And uh, some of the people that we've developed uh, through behavior-based safety have already moved into other supervisory, safety management, or safety training roles uh, that uh, they're able to, to develop their, their skills more in the future. And we think that we have some more people that are in that pipeline too. As you can tell, I'm, I'm very enthusiastic about what we've done at the ARCH operations in the last five years with behavior-based safety. But what's more important is was what our employees think. At a recent meeting, we asked some of our facilitators what they thought about behavior-based safety and whether they thought it was making a difference. And here are some of the comments that they, they, they said. Uh, Behavior-based safety is improving communication within the, within all levels of the organization. It's involving more people directly in safety. It's providing hourly employees with an opportunity to use their talents. Uh, we've been able to get employees who were initially negative to support the process. It's a vehicle that we've used to help improve our safety culture, and it's affecting our behavior both on and off the job. Uh, m most of our operations currently track uh, off-the-job injuries now as well as uh, uh, work-related injuries because if, if somebody's injured and not there at work, it doesn't make any difference where they've been hurt at. Uh, so they're taking a lot of these uh, things home and uh, using these practices in their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, a few other comments from um, uh, 
from our facilitators. Uh, the process uh, has involved the workforce and empowered them uh, to be self-directed in improving safety. Uh, it, it holds employees accountable for their own safety performance. And it empowers employees to make uh, the change in a positive way. Uh, and it's a format that can be applied to a lot of different problem-solving structures. You know, as I mentioned, um, our foundation principle at Arch is home safely every day. Uh, John and I are still in the same photograph off of Wayne Colette. <laughs> uh, and, uh, I think that every layer of our safety process uh, makes a contribution to helping us get closer to that goal of the perfect zero. Uh, over the, uh, the past uh, seven years, I think we've expanded uh, our culture of safety uh, to eliminate more and more at-risk behaviors. And uh, at Arch, we view each day as, as one more step on our path to the perfect zero. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here.